Hi. Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome to this Artist to Artist with Adrian Marie Brown, who is sitting next to me. I still can't believe that it's actually sitting next to me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I didn't tell you yet how much of a fangirl I am. You didn't tell me at all. Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Well, um, I think it's me and the other fan people here in the, in the audience. A warm welcome to you guys. Um, my name is Isabel Sheridan. I'm your moderator tonight. And uh, tonight we'll talk about what happens at the intersection of art and activism. Mm -hmm. And also much, much more, I think. I think we can fill a night with much, much more. Um, and it won't just be the two of us. With us here, uh, engaging in conversation with Adrian Marie Brown, our um, writer and social commentator, Muganyende Helen Castell, uh, theater maker, Gavin Fiano, and vis visual artist and designer, Bodil Uwe Draugo. A warm welcome to all of you. Um, they all wrote a reflection on Adrian's wonderful wor work. It's called Emergent Strategy, for those who haven't read it. Give your book gets the applause. <laughs> That's so um, great. That's so great. Um, but, well, before we uh, get a chance to talk to each other, mm. I would also really want to welcome you guys. Because you're, you're here yeah. as an audience, but also feel welcome to be a part of this conversation. I kind of, to be honest, I kind of imagined a little different setup uh, for this <laughs> evening, where we could actually engage more with each other and have you close with yeah, us. Yeah. But unfortunately, tomorrow there is a very early, early um, funeral. We normally don't do funerals, but this is an occasion that we just, yeah. Um, Wait, what do you mean you normally don't have funerals? Well, this is meant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not part of our core programming, but due to a very special. Oh, a funeral as a part of the program. Okay. Yeah, I understand. So we were tied to this uh, position. But please, if you want to contribute to this conversation, then I would just suggest. Uh, Talking, standing up, maybe ra you don't even have to raise your hand. Just tr try and uh, yeah, try to come with us. I can also come to you with a mic if you are more comfortable with talking into a microphone. Um, but let's first get to know each other a little bit. Um, I was wondering, I read Emergent Strategy. Who else did? This is not school, but I just want to know what kind of audience we have. Um, <laughs> These are fans, Adrian. Thank you for reading, y'all. Uh, mm. Who read Pleasure Activism? Who uh, considers themselves a pleasure activist? Trying. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I actually hosted, well, I had the honor of hosting a book club on pleasure activism. Thank you. <laughs> uh, which was such a wonderful experience. It was 30 degrees outside, but we were here inside uh, while talking to each other, connecting. Beautiful. And the first question that I asked was, what made you feel good today? Mm. Just to get to know each other, you know? Mm. And it gave me so many really nice answers. So just to get to know you guys, I would like to ask you the same thing. <laughs> what made you feel good today? And don't be shy. I'll just be walking around until somebody raises their hand and be like, I want to share. <laughs> Over there. Can we pass this microphone? Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. I've never had a microphone in my hand before. <laughs> We're so for oh everything. My gosh. We're popping the microphone, Sherry. <laughs> um, a really nice little story that I got on the ferry boat from North and was with the last three people rushing. Uh, mm. And one of them turned around and said to the other two, Where are you going? And we all told our mm. stories, and I said I was coming here. And that was really nice. And then we all, I've Goosebumps. We all uh, said goodbye at the end and went our own ways, but we talked the whole ferry ride. That's wonderful. I love the little interaction. Who else feels like sharing something good? Running over there. Man, I have a job to do as a moderator. <laughs> Coming all the way? Tell me. Um, yeah, I work in children's psychiatry, and I took one of my clients for a mindful walk today. Uh, and he's almost 14, uh, and I could tell he found it a little bit awkward in the beginning, and then at the end he was like, that was actually really relaxing, and that made me feel really good. That's so and he nice. enjoyed it, so it's, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you people who are also here right now. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> like, what did I miss? What did I miss? No, you're very welcome. Um, so maybe we have time for one last story. Who wants to share something good about today, about how they felt? Don't we shy? We have a birthday person. <gasps> okay. Whose birthday Sorry. is it? If this is your birthday, this is a good birthday. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday to ya. Happy birthday. <laughs> If that, that is a great start of an evening, then what a birthday, then I don't know what is. The question is, what made you feel good today, apart from the obvious moment that just happened? So much to tell. I don't know where to start. I had the best day ever. All of these people surprised me and tricked me to coming here. And it is the best surprise ever. I got clues, I got, clues, I got so much love and cuddles and food and wine and flowers and this hat. I mean, the best day ever. Wow. Oh my God. Okay, we peaked. That is beautiful. Okay. <laughs> I think that this is exactly <laughs> the energy we need to start off our nights. I'm good. I feel fully yeah. satisfied. Yeah, I get that. Um, <laughs> okay. That is a great hat. That is a great oh. hat. Okay, Adrian, I've already kind of introduced you, but please let me uh, say that Adrian Marie <laughs> is a writer, she's a social commentator, she's a pleasure activist, she's a community organizer, artist, meme queen, auntie, doula, and Beyonce's biggest fan. <laughs> Here she is. Adrian, um, Wait, I already Can mentioned. I ask them, how many of you received the blessing of Beyonce? Oh my God, y'all, wasn't she perfect in every I way? <laughs> I'm still drooling. Yeah, I was free. When did you go? Well, Saturday, we went to Beyonce. And I have to say, we had to organize it with the Holland Fest because when, we saw it, when I saw it, when she released the dates, and it was like she was going to be here, and I knew that we were booked on the 18th, and I was like, okay. So I went ahead and bought the tickets right away. And then the organizers, Joachim, was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And I was like, it is. <laughs> We'll figure it out. We can rehearse it from 9 a.m. We'll be fine. And we worked it out. And almost, almost everyone in the show actually went to see her on Saturday night in some way. Yeah. That's beautiful. What was your favorite moment about the show? Oh, God. I think... You have to choose, right? Um, yeah. I mean, for me, it's like one continuous favorite experience. But I will say, I'll say my favorite piece of the set design was... She had a portal, and it's a picture of her legs coming up and out on either side, and you just keep going deeper and deeper into the portal. And I was like, make it plain. <laughs> like, <laughs> make it plain. You are the mother. We all know what's happening. Oh, and Clarice was there, too. Oh, there's too. Clarice Gargard <laughs> gracing us with our, her presence. Yeah. You're very welcome. And also, I just the sound of her voice, the quality of the voice in that stadium was sickening to me. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, how do you do that? Anyway. I mean, she's perfect to me, so. Well, I think half of the audience knows now. After seeing her live, I'm very jealous. Thank you. Um, but Adrian, <laughs> um, yes. so I asked a, asked a question to the audience, asking them what <laughs> gave them joy. Um, and I was wondering, what gave you joy today? Uh, <laughs> well, so a lot of things. OK, do you want to be honest, honest? Let's go. So last night was one of the best nights of my life, like ever, ever, ever. What we got to put together was so incredible. And after that, I'm like, how do I relax and release energy? So today I took a space cake. I had sex all day. I watched Battlestar Galactica. And I did not leave my bedroom until it was time to come here. <laughs> I love that for you. I'm and really trying to practice what I preach, you know? Yes, exactly. Yes. Exactly. It sounds like a perfect way to start off this evening of talking to Thank all you. of your fans. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I highly recommend it for a Monday. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll take my next Monday off and okay. do the same thing. 
Yeah. But I'm gonna hold you to it. I'm gonna be like, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about it. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. So let's get back to that performance. <laughs> um, to feel a thing, a ritual for emergence. Yes. It happened yesterday. It happened. Can you tell who? Wait. Who was there again? Yeah, that's a lot wow, of people. Thank you so much. But maybe for the people who, who weren't don't there, know, who weren't there, could you like shed Let's some say. light on what happened there? Um, yeah, I can. I think I can. I, so, I mean, I am curious to hear what happened for other people, obviously. But for me, you know, a few years I've always written songs, but always like kind of privately. And then a few years ago, I started sharing them and. I got connected to other people around them, and this ritual has emerged. And each time, I understand something new about it. Like, I keep following it, and people keep coming into it and weaving into it. So last night, I think what happened, I came in, and for me, the practice was to meditate, to call my ancestors into the space. And they literally came up, like, I was meditating as everyone was entering the space and all my ancestors came one by one, some that I recognized and some that I had not met before. And they just came and were like, I'm here. And so after that, I'm not quite sure exactly what happened, but everyone had told me, don't expect a response from the audience. The Dutch don't get down like this gospel <laughs> thing you're doing. So you. you're just gonna sing to them and they're just gonna watch you and it's gonna be beautiful. Mm. And so that's what I was expecting. And then <laughs> like, I think the first or second song, everyone's off their feet, dancing, jumping around. And I was like, okay, let's have a ritual. So we had a ritual. We had these, all these local folks who wove in because of Clarice. So Clarice reached out to me and was like, I'm a part of this. And so we wove and, and figured out, you know, we'd never met before, but we figured out how to collaborate with each other. So she gave a testimony about the conditions here. And we had Nana Afua, a Winti priestess, who came and gave a prayer and blessing of protection for all of us. Mm -hmm. We had Ernestine come and bless us with a poem. And in the middle, it was song after song that is moving us through different um, stages of emotion and asking ourselves, what is it we believe? How does that move us into action? How do we actually drop into feeling? And then for me personally, I struggle a lot with wanting to be numb in the face of the hopelessness and despair yeah, of the current conditions. About that. It's just yeah. called numb. I wrote it, I was drunk, I was high, and I was like, I can still feel too much. Mm -hmm. And my heart is broken, I can still feel the sharp edges of it. And I need to get further away from the feeling. And so I sang the song, and you can hear it like in the original voice note. <laughs> I record everything into like voice memos on my phone. Mm -hmm. and you can hear it like it's like a mess. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you can hear, I'm crying, I'm like, I wanna be done. Or just a process is never easy. No, it's disgusting, mm -hmm. but it's wonderful because if you're honest, if you really create when you're hurting the most, mm -hmm. um, and if someone's willing to meet you, like Troy is like, I'll listen to that and I can pull out something that is ugly and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, but then we were like, come with us. And everyone came with us. And we made it through the numbness. And we remembered how to feel something. And by the end, it just kept, I kept being like, that's the highest we'll go. And then the next song, everyone would be elevated more. So. Can you describe the energy in that room? <sighs> it felt like we were one body. Like it felt like we got to be one body. Um, everyone moving in different ways, but moving together. Mm -hmm. Does that feel right? We're yeah. Looking at the audience, yeah. And it was like, um, I mean, dancing. I, I saw a lot of freedom. It, I would say that a lot of people looked like they were moving in ways they may have never moved before, including me. I was singing in ways I've never sung before. I was like, bitch. <laughs> I, was, I was like really like, I mean, we'll see what it sounds like afterwards, but it felt like the Little Mermaid. I was like, OK. <laughs> You know, still You're got wonderful. it. You're wonderful. Yeah, yeah, but it was beautiful. I was, I don't know. Does that feel accurate, Clarice? Yeah. That was wonderful. Is that also, um, because I feel like the word, the concept emergence translates really difficultly to, uh, to Dutch. Yeah. Um, is that also like what you just said about this being one experience, one. one organism? Is that what you also mean with the concept of emergence? So the definition of emergence I use is the way complex systems and patterns arise out of relatively simple interactions. So I talk about one bird yeah. flaps its wings, a bird flying. Yeah. But if 500 
do it together at the right distance, they stay alive when a predator is trying to eat them. And they make this beautiful shape. And humans do this. Everything does this. But for me, emergence can be good or bad, right? Like it's not, it's actually a neutral concept yeah. because it's how everything comes to exist, including mosquitoes and rats and like <laughs> everything. The things you don't want, yeah. So the strategy part of it is what matters. It's like, how do we acknowledge that the world develops in this way? This is actually the truth of what These is. complex patterns. Yes. And all the complex patterns come out of the simple, small interactions. Can we humble ourselves to rigorously practice the simple, small things over and over again if we want to create new, complex systems and patterns? Mm -hmm. And so like, if we're in a very complex, fucked up climate catastrophe, mm -hmm. and the simple moves we have to take are, for instance, not flying, <laughs> eating vegan, da 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 why do we struggle so hard to make the simple move that would create a new complex pattern of food systems and weather systems and everything else? And I'm, as non, a non-vegan person who flew here, right, in the <laughs> contradiction of that, right, yeah. is I'm like asking myself all the time, what are the right small adjustments to make? Because each generation is making the small adjustment, adjustments that create the society. Um, so and that's what I'm asking. You've got a lot of people on board. You do and you don't. Like in any place, I mean, this is the beauty of social justice work. You know, I've done social justice organizing for 25 years, facilitation. And I've always been very prone to the direct action side of it mm. because I'm always really moved by how, you know, people be like, thousands of people can't do this, but like five people will go shut down the BART station in San Francisco and yeah. all of a sudden we're having a conversation about Black Lives Matter on the national news. I love that kind of thing where like we, we, a small group of people can get your attention, but then masses of people have to open their hearts, mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, you got my attention. Am I willing to consider myself part of the part of problem and it. the solution, right? And I have, you know, my sister is here tonight, and we have these beautiful parents who are, you know, really open-hearted, but I, I know I've watched them be frustrated with the situation, but like not take action. And I always talk to them about that, right? I'm like, well, you're upset about this. You're throwing something at the TV. What are you going to do about it, right? What did they say? And well, my mom is actually incredible at this. She's like, I am doing something. I'm negotiating with my family who's, my mother's white, and she comes from a family that has racism, transphobia, homophobia, fatphobia, like the whole package. The whole shebang. The whole shebang. Yeah. And so she's like, my work is staying in a good relationship with them and helping to bring them along, such that yeah. this year, after a 10-year break from being able to see my grandmother, I'm able to reconnect with her this year because yeah. of my mom doing her small, constant relational organizing, yeah. right? So I'm like, those moves really matter. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I go out in the world, this is actually, I've had to humble myself, because I used to only be like, if you're not a hardcore activist, you know, rappelling off the yeah, side yeah. of a building yeah. with a banner, or like, you know, doing the hardcore actions or like throwing a Molotov cocktail or whatever. What are you doing? You know, and for a long time, that's how I came home to, I think, family dinner. Right. Mm. So fun. <laughs> you must sorry. Last. It was so fun. But now I'm like, you know, yesterday was Father's Day and I was able to have like the most authentic gratitude towards my father because I'm like, oh, from an emergent strategy lens, I can see how much you have transformed in your lifetime by loving me, mm. just by loving me just by loving our, your queer children, right? So there's things like this that I, I think, I keep trying to think about like, okay, the future, I still have a very big vision of the future that I want, but I have to have faith in all the small moves it takes to get there. And everybody has their own role to play yes. within that yes. system. And unfortunately, I'm not in charge. So I really, I really <laughs> would, great. I mean, if it was set up some other way, where it was like Virgos could just come up with a solution, <laughs> that everyone had to try. We can I actually that. wrote this, a short story about this in mm -hmm. one of my books, Fables and Spells. It's called the Virgoan, and there's actually an alien species <laughs> that only connects with Virgos and is like, we know what the right way to do everything is, but they actually drive the Virgos mad because they're like, that's not a relevant thing in the human <laughs> world. That's wonderful. Is there also an alien species that connects to Leos? or? I'm sure there that. is. I think I'm hoping that people will fan fiction their own astrology into it because I feel like so that's the invitation. The invitation stands. Yeah, because I'm like I know Virgos most intimately. I could probably do one on Sagittarians. I could probably do one on Pisces. 
shit, I could do this. This. <laughs> I think we're waiting for the next book. Well, books. I think you need a lot of volumes for this. Yeah, um, I, need, I need to write more books. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think it's now time uh, to introduce our, uh, yes, our other panelists. They're already sitting here on the front row, and they're ready to go, I think. Can I have a warm applause for Munga Nyan, Helen Christel, Gavin Viano, and Badil Uedraogo. Oh my God. Please join us. Thank you. Hi. We're here. Uh, whilst you guys get settled, I'm also going to properly introduce you because I already have it written down. Um, Theatre maker and actor Gavin Fiana's work radiates social urgency. Through his grassroots initiatives, he addresses themes that affect the black community, the human rights community, the queer community, and the vulnerable youth. Period. Period. Bam. Mic drop. You're here. Great that you're here. Uh, Munganyanda Helen Kersel is a social commentator, activist, and writer. She writes socially critical prose and essays focusing on topics like race, identity, feminism, and, of course, Beyonce, let's be honest. Um, okay. And she's currently working on her debut novel that hopefully she will share a little bit about in a oh. bit. Uh, and then we have <laughs> Bodil Owe Drago. Um, she's a visual artist, fashion designer, who explores the intersection of clothing and cultural contexts. Um, her work goes beyond fashion design, incorporating textiles, music, and dance into immersive installations. Welcome, guys. <laughs> You're like, yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to ask you what your favorite moment was last week, because I, I know that you all went to Beyonce, so this is an easy one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, going back to yesterday's performance, what do you... Munganenda, you guys were there. Uh, how was that for you? It was great, and uh, also way more than I expected, because I think on the website I saw that it was like one and a half hour, right? <laughs> and I thought maybe... I also the rehearsal was. Oh, the rehearsal was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. No, and I uh, really did not expect it that we uh, were allowed to have such a big role yeah. into mm. it. Um, and that was really special. Uh, I thought it would be more watching or hearing, learning. Uh -huh. uh, but it was great. And I told you guys before, I normally never really sing. But first it was three hours Beyonce and then three hours Adrienne Marie. So I was uh, very happy. I think I have to do it more. Yeah. How was that for you, Um It really took me back. I was talking uh, about this to Clarice as well. It took, it took us, if I may speak for us too, but it took, <laughs> it took me back to um, growing up in church. In, um, and, and, but in a, in a queer emergent way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So taking you back to a space that has, that like, in that space, you could feel spirit, but you weren't allowed in in a way to tap into the the eroticness of that spirit, the queerness of that spirit, the blackness of that spirit, um, and, and then ending up being rejected. So in a way, it's very much reminded me of the the church girl song. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then yeah. a better way, even. Yeah. It, it it sur it surpassed the, the the physical to me, yeah, definitely. And Gavin Fiano, I was wondering because you couldn't make it unfortunately yesterday because you had to go to Beyonce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you went twice. <laughs> I, I was like I, I, everyone I'm who obsessed. came. I was like, so you could have gone to Beyonce and you came here. Cool, but like I I totally understand. I already booked my ticket. I understand there are some things in life that I'm obsessed about and uh, that's. Mariah Carey, The Little Mermaid, and Beyonce. Oh my God. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? I, like, I already went twice to Me too. Ali's version. Oh first my time. God, she's the Little my Mermaid sister, Queen. My sister, second time by myself. <laughs> I was seven years old again. Like, love yes. it. I'm going to take my nephew. Everybody go see it. I really want tentacles. <laughs> you love it? I enough? really want tentacles now. Mm. Yes. Yes, Eris a lot. Mm. <laughs> Mm. I love that for you. You, you had a great excuse. Um, guys, you're here. <laughs> Welcome. Um, I was wondering, maybe we could start by just introducing your work uh, a little bit to the audience, because I think we all want to know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could start with you, Munganyana, because you wrote this <laughs> wonderful book. 
on Beyonce, but you write so much more. Um, what are some of the current themes you're into? Um, first, let me say about this book, I'm very honored to have been able to work with a group of amazing uh, black feminists from the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, behind the scenes, we had to actually uh, push for this book to be blackity black, like black women, mm. um, because the... Um, 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 behind the scenes, we were getting questions about how diverse it would be if it would only be black women, like how diverse the, the sort of, the way of looking at this was gonna be. Um, so, <laughs> and um, so what, I think what we did collectively with this book is, um, um, I mean, Clarice is in this book, Ernestine is in this book, there's Clarice. a lot of amazing people in this book, Clarice is everywhere anyway, <laughs> she's in this book, and uh, this is my life, but um, uh, Liberté, Egalité, Beyoncé stands for the, the Republic of Beyoncé run by these three rules. Um, and and we, we're, we're really working with, with um, um, uh, honoring through critique, to, through yes. radical critique. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean? It, it means, um, um, I think that when it comes to black women and blackness, uh, there's this, there's this, this, this idea that we cannot like stand in community together and think critically about um, our positions in the world and how we uh, how we take up space in the in in these emergent strategies, right? So I think that honoring through critique uh, in in a very loving way is something that we did through this book. Um, and in general, I think w what what I the role that I try to play, that I attempt to play in my community is to, um, to, to organize these womanist interventions to, um, to really think about what it means to, um, to live a, a good black life. Mm. Um, yeah. And what, what that looks like. Mm. What have you found so far? A lot of things. A lot of things. And, but I've, it's not about what I found, it's about what I felt, mostly, and how my community has helped me feel through, um, through the, the, through this existence to get to a place where, um, Mm. Yeah. Where you can really sit in that body and, and, and really, yeah. really feel it. Feel the feel body, it. yeah. Yeah. And honor it, yeah. Thank you. That is, mm. that is beautiful. Thank mm. you for sharing that. Wait, how do you feel right now? I feel, um, in Dutch, I would say I feel, I feel too stemming. Permission. <laughs> yes, and in Dutch, it, it means like, it, 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 it reads differently for me in Dutch because two stemming is like, it's permission, but it's also like giving in. Mm -hmm. It's also adding to mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. multiplicity of voices. Mm -hmm. I, I, f I feel very comfortable standing next to the light. Uh -huh. mm, yes. So these, this, 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 these conversations and this question is uncomfortable in that way because yeah. it, uh, is, it asks of me to stand in the light, but I feel very comfortable standing next to the light. Mm. But I feel, that, I feel that permission of also standing in the light and inside the light, and, and that actually started yesterday. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this when you were talking about the role of, I, I think we share this because when you're talking about the role of, of honoring through critique or honoring the engagement of the work, for most of my life, I've been a facilitator. And so I'm always like next to the light. I'm like, everyone here is the most amazing person. They're the most amazing mm. organizer. And my job is to almost become a part of the wall, mm. the container, mm. and to make sure that they know how excellent they are and that when we're done, all they feel is their own excellence and not me, right? Mm. Not a reliance on me. Just mm. like, we're fucking great. <laughs> and now we can go make the world change or whatever. Yeah. And now this process of becoming an artist or st bringing the art part of me forward Literally, the director of the piece last night, the whole time, is just like, can you slow down, take a deep breath, stand in the light? Like, people came to listen to something that you want to say. And I'm like, but I don't know what to say. She's like, but you will. Just slow down and take a deep breath and feel it in the moment. And I was like, that, no, I got to like write a poem. Or I got to do something that's like... Create work. And also put it back to them. And she's like, you can put it back to them all you want to you're gonna be in the light when the moment comes. Mm. But then I'm laughing now because you were out of my vision mm. and then you came up and put yourself directly in front of me. And it was such a huge part of my experience last night to look out and see you <laughs> in the light. <laughs> so mm. I'm like, I love this. I can feel you right now a lot. <laughs> yeah. And we're full circle now sitting here yeah. again after that. Um, <laughs> I also wanted to go to you. Um, Kevin Viano, I think we have a, a small clip from <laughs> your latest work. Um, oh, yeah. From Blood Sense, that's not your latest work, from Blood Sense. Um, shall we go watch it? Yeah, great. Can we dim the lights? Mm. It's also interesting how the body works. Can we turn it up? See, my body senses things that my mind simply cannot conceive. <laughs> It's like my body has stored events from the past, which results in emotional roller coasters. Let's call these roller coasters moments. Sometimes my mind is a slow one to follow, but more often my mind is the instigator. I'm sure that it can live on without the body, which brings me to the duality of mind and body, two totally different planes with two totally different approaches. And a mind, a body one, and how do 11-year-olds handle these two? <laughs> this was such a short, a short piece, but maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's, what we just saw here. Yeah, um, this is uh, Princess Bangura, mm. an amazing performer I studied with um, at the Theatre Academy in Maastricht. Um, she's from Sierra Leone, I'm from Suriname, um, my parents are, and um, when I was studying there, she was already dope, she had a great energy, but we never mm -hmm. found the opportunity to work together. Mm -hmm. And now that I, we both graduated, I wanted to mm -hmm. tell a story about overcoming sexual trauma mm -hmm. uh, through uh, ancestral guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, who's gonna tell this story? And Princess was the right one to do so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we mingled the religion from Sierra Leone with the Surinamese religion, it was so interesting mm -hmm. just to exchange all these African roots and there were so many similarities but also beautiful differences. Like what? Um, like, um, for instance, uh, the Surinamese religion um, is really um, instigated uh, through wind, the yes. winti pre, um, and also in the Sierra Leonean religion, um, uh, they say, uh, look up to the sky, because that's where the power is. Mm. So that's how we started to connect the dots. The sky um, and the wind. Exactly. Um, and we just also wanted to make the work, the story, Black Re Black. Um, mm. We're in the Netherlands, uh, yeah. the Dutch theater oh, sector. Yeah. Um, um, unfortunately, is still predominantly very white. So here we are, the black kids. And what are we going to tell? We 
we also love Shakespeare and Ibsen, but we also love our own stories and yeah. our own truths. Mm -hmm. Truths, um, and that's why we can love why them we, equally. Exactly. Each other. Exactly. Yeah. So it was just homecoming, and just it felt so warm to claim that space with her yeah. and to tell this story. And I was crying during rehearsals because yeah. she was mm -hmm. improvising, and it was so spiritual. And I, I told her. Try to also dance uh, through the fingertip, through your fingertips, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the, the the energy that was transcending at that moment. Yeah, I just cannot explain it. Mm -hmm. But she was crying, I was crying, and then we were like, okay, we're on the right track. It's beautiful. You already <laughs> yeah. noticed yeah. that yeah. intensity yeah. conveying in that that single moment. That's sixty seconds. Yeah, of and that. it's also in English. In school, we were always taught like everything has to be in Dutch. Yeah, fuck um, that. But we grew up <laughs> bilingual, right? Yeah, so yeah. Yes. Finally, we got the chance to create our own um, art. So also being able to um, make the choice for our own language is also, you know, taking ownership of our art agency empowerment. So, um, yeah, I really want you all to see the whole piece. Um, yeah. How do we? Back in September. Okay, so I have to come back and say yeah, that. Yeah, 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 during <laughs> Write the it theater, down. theater festival, Blood yeah. Scent. Yeah. Um, yeah. I saw it because I saw the registration, and it's, it's seriously incredible, and it moved me a lot. Thank you. Did. Thank you. Yeah. Um, last but not least, Vadil, um, you're a fashion designer, and um, I, put, I got some uh, pictures of the work you did. Um, really beautiful work, uh, and I was wondering, as a f fashion designer, what stories are you trying to convey with the designs that you make? What are you currently mm. thinking about? Uh, I think, first of all, I, I, uh, I would say I'm an artist more, or I'm just an artist. Um, mm. And um, what concepts was the question, or what? What kinds what? of stories? Are you interested in at the moment? I think for me, it's always the story that I'm interested in is myself, mm. um, and I think that resonates well, no. with more people. But or that's yep. what I hope. But <laughs> in the, um, it has to start with myself, and um, I try to find connections um, within the art of dressing up. I'm looking. Uh, at fashion as an art form mm -hmm. and the cultural surroundings around dressing up um, and I find try to find connections and see how can diverse styles or differences uh, uplift one another mm -hmm. um, and I think the biggest interest within that is finding ways um, how I can show all these different parts of myself instead of choosing one or the other and trying to find a way how they can be layered over each other mm -hmm. or maybe how I can show neg neglected parts and give light on them. Uh, so the full self becomes visible. Yeah, and I think that's just... Um, I think when you are black or when you're a woman, uh, people have all these ideas about you mm -hmm. uh, and it just gets hard to see through all that um, uh, and to figure out what, is it, what it actually is mm -hmm. and what you miss and um, to be honest to the self also um, and I think that was also really a part I studied uh, fashion four, four years ago now mm -hmm. but in art academy um, and there, most of the teachers were also white, or actually, <laughs> all of them, right. the whole school. <laughs> yeah. I was the only student with all of the else. teachers. Yeah, in all of the teachers, most definitely. We, I Welcome think we had Netherlands. Three, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, three, three students uh, who were black. Um, and then you have to you have to talk about your concepts, but then people don't really get it, mm -hmm. and then. But they are sort of, or, or they don't like the fact they don't, that they don't get it, or they want to talk about it with you, but it doesn't really help mm. yourself because you get so frustrated that you think, like, how can you not get this? And then I came home 
sometimes to my mother or my sister, I was like, okay, I explained this like five times now. How can I do it better? Because still they want to put me on the other, on the, on the other path. Or and what better I do? means in the context of the other. You yeah. The, and then the your whole concept mm. changes in someone else's contorting. misunderstanding. Um, and then I switched schools, and then, uh, <laughs> and then <laughs> you solved the problem. Yeah, well, well then not I just the problem, like, okay, but yeah. If I want to talk about my ideas, then I do that with people outside of yeah. uh, outside of the academy. Right, you are. And uh, right you when are. it's just about technique, yeah. <laughs> I do it here. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. We actually, before we go to our first reflection, we'll, which will be read by you. Um, we are going to watch a little teaser of your work, which relates to the thing you're going to read. Yeah, it's a it's a teaser of a video I made. It's a video installation, uh, and the teaser is I think 30 seconds or something. But the video is way longer. But yeah. now we will see a teaser, and after you will see some. I think when I start talking, you will see some Images. research pictures. How I uh, yeah. Beautiful. So, Adrian, these wonderful people have all read your book and took a, they took a little piece from it that they felt they could really relate to. Okay. And they wrote something about it. Oh my goodness. I know. You knew this was going to happen. <laughs> well, it would be hard if, they, if this was also a surprise for them, I though. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> um, and I would first like to uh, ask Badil, to read out hers. You can choose if you want to do that here or behind the cathedral, wherever you are most comfortable. Mm. I quite like it here. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I start with a quote of Adrian, and after there will be another quote, but you will hear that. I'm living a life I don't regret, a life that will resonate with my ancestors and with as many generations forward as I can imagine. I am attending to this crisis of my lifetime with my best self. I am of my communities that are doing our collective best mm -hmm. to honor our ancestors and all humans to come. First of all, thank you so much for the work that you do. The radical imagination connected with the way I intend to work in my practice and gave me a lot of hope and strength. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, my father is from, from Burkina Faso, my mother is from the Netherlands. Um, in Burkina Faso, people everywhere reminded me over and over again that a person is not alone, but overly connected. All the pieces of a person's history are akin and make you who you are. Not one or the other, not Dutch, Burkina Bay, street culture, haute couture, nor gender, but identity, the self, is one big connected web in which all these threads together are what makes it a whole and above all, what makes it unique, complex, and appealing. This idea about identity is the core of my work. When someone introduced me in Burkina Faso, they never just gave my name. It goes in a way where all my connections were explained. Hello, good day, this is the daughter of, the auntie of, the student from. Uh -huh. hmm. This is also what my, what my father asked me when he asked me how I am. How is it with the little sister of Rita referring to me? This is how I got my daily affirmation. Instead of a way more and maybe Western way of introducing someone by just saying, this is Bodil Wedrago. Another quote of Adrian, which resonated for me. We are never just individual bodies, individual traumas. Our, our lives and the way, ways we survive are interconnected. I often have the feeling that people get confused about identity and ask you to choose a part of yourself. What for me leads to an incomplete and maybe even a feeling of dishonest to the self. Mm. In my work, I try to find ways to nurture and honor every part of the self. 
how can we stand in line with who went before us? How to portray an imagination where all these parts are layered and see-through? Mm. Mm. I think the trying to portray all these parts of the self or giving light on forgotten or neglected parts of the self as for a radical imagination. Taking up space by presenting an alternative where you show that you are overly connected. In my latest research, I tried doing that by, by embodying African wooden art. In these pieces of our heritage, you see how our ancestors used to present bodies through sculptures. What can I, what can we learn from the way that these bodies pose? Our res uh, a research about posing, bearing, and posi positioning yourself, a longing to who went before us, longing to express togetherness through material heirlooms. I try to capture the human intimacy of West African wooden art, presenting the ability to express the generational connection by embodying. I propose to give them space in the present. How can I enrich representation of people by framing them, wearing them, or enlarging them? Mm. Mm. My work is informed by the connections I find within the art of dressing up after truly examining different cultural aspects within black culture that at first glance seem to be far apart. Mm. How can a connection between diverse styles enrich and uplift each other? The first time I created a live installation, I felt a weight falling off of me. All of a sudden, the question or disagrees about my ideas or concepts weren't valid anymore. Mm. We brought the installation to life, and therefore it was part of reality, and we shared a new lived experience. Mm -hmm. For me, this felt as a form of radical imagination, if mm -hmm. I understood you right. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you for that, Badil. Thank you. I love that line. How can we stand in line with those who went before us? Yeah, I think also with this research now, um, my father uh, is born in Burkina Faso and he's a collector of West mm. African wooden art since, since forever. Mm. Uh, and it was also one of the reasons that he came to the Netherlands. Mm. And there's so much... Wait, can you slow that down? Yeah. How would his fascination in West African wooden art be why he came to the Netherlands? To sell. To sell it. To sell. <laughs> yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. I'm like, are, do they have a lot here? Do we need to take it back? Well, we have. <laughs> <laughs> well everything is here. Uh huh. True. And that's True that. The, yeah. He mm -hmm. came, he was collecting there a lot. Uh, then he came here and he tried to sell. Uh, two reasons he never sold. One, you can't really sell these pieces mm -hmm. uh, if they are straight from the country. Mm. So they have, if, when they are for a longer time in Europe, they are uh, they worth accumulate way more. their value. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because they say when it's there, then maybe it's not old enough or blah, 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 blah. So when it's in, <laughs> for a longer time in hands of, of uh, white collectors, the price goes up. But another reason is that I think my father is not really a businessman. But I think, mm -hmm. uh, and also I don't think these pieces mm -hmm. are part of business for him, but they are yeah. very, very spiritually. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you can't really walk in his house. It's filled up. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the reasons yeah. why he's not, or he says he's not so homesick. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. He's taking care of them all the time. Uh, and it used to be something uh, which was way more uh, present within, within communities yeah. and also uh, in Burkina Faso self most people uh, see it as or haram or hidens I don't know how do you say that mm -hmm. like forbidden yeah mm -hmm. people connect it on to uh, uh, nature beliefs mm -hmm. and I think that's also a colonial idea that we think it's not okay anymore mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit and all the other beautiful pieces, most of them are stolen, are here in, in Paris or in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was thinking about ancestors and uh, I was thinking about f the feeling that you have, that you have to figure it out all yourself. And I've, well, of course it's not like that, like people went before mm -hmm. us and yeah. um, what can I see from that? And then when, it, when I was 
small kids. Sometimes in my father's house, these pieces were, some of them were almost my height. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then when you walk by, you look them in the eyes, and yes. then uh, I had with a few of them, I was like, okay. You had a special friend, little relationship really like with that them. one or what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this household together. Yeah. It's really um, beautiful. And I miss that feeling. Uh, yeah. And also the way, um, the ability I had then to look at them and to be more in contact with them. Mm -hmm. So then I started 3, 3D printing them mm -hmm. and making big models. As we out just of them. saw in yeah. the thing, yeah. Can I? Yeah. There's something in what you're saying right now that is like really resonating because I feel like something I've been figuring out very slowly is, you know, my parents. I'm also mixed race, come from a black and white family, and I think originally my parents were like, racism is going to be going away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> We're, we're good, and then it took a while for me to get old enough to recognize like we're really at the very beginning of the reclamation of our humanity, and, and white folks are at, very, at the very beginning still of understanding the impact of their ancestors and their current impact, and I think it's humbling for everyone in the mix to actually realize we're just not very far along in the reclamation and rebalancing and reorganizing process. Mm -hmm. Because so many artists, I find, it's like we set out to do something else, and then something ancestral pulls us back to like, wait, mm -hmm. we have to go back and mm -hmm. remember. Like, mm -hmm. sitting in the circle yesterday, a lot of people came up and were like, oh, in Senegal, we sit around the tree and we do this. Oh, here in Suriname, you know, the Winti Princess, she's like, this is what we do, girl. Like we just mm. sit around, we just sit around a circle and we pray. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. Everyone's like, it's no big deal. Like, but for me, as someone who was like intentionally displaced, you know, mm -hmm. from whatever that lineage was that my father would carry, all the way down to his father. We don't know who his father is, so it's cut off. For someone like me to be like, I can feel that I'm supposed to be in a circle with people doing this ritual, mm -hmm. and I don't know how to do it, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna figure it out. And like for you, you're like, oh, I grew up around this, mm -hmm. but I can feel that there's something else that's supposed to yeah. happen with mm -hmm. it now, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's like, I just feel like there's someone like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Being big. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The body yeah. remembers. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, yeah. yeah. And I was also wondering, yeah. um, looking at our other panelists, what, what, do, what does the <laughs> idea of ancestors mean to you? How do you relate to that personally? <laughs> <laughs> Not all at once. Um, uh, yeah. First of all, let me say that when I first encountered Bodil's work, it was the first time for me seeing the uh, West African boo-boo in a <clears throat> I'm 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 like tearing up because of it in a um, artistic mm. context mm. on purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let me just erase artistic context and just say on purpose. On purpose. Mm. Um, and that really moved something inside of me, and I just I just know that. Um, it was during fashion week, and you had these see-through boo-boos. It was like out of this world, see-through boo-boos. I want that. Dancers <laughs> in see-through boo-boos. Yes, I want it. And then, and then she, <laughs> and then she had like a um, uh, like a, a, f a film projected on the see-through boo-boos, like. <laughs> I want this whole experience. <laughs> like, <laughs> how do you? What? <laughs> I have to move here. <laughs> and You're welcome. I have, like, so much stuff. I love to have you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to have you. Um, I know. I'm like, there's so much stuff to do. Yeah. So as uh, as um, someone who relates to that that yeah. specific region, um, um, that was super special. So when I speak of ancestry, um, I would say I I. I I really enjoy when it's on purpose, mm -hmm. um, intentional. Yeah, and I when like when too. I'm called <laughs> when I'm called to it, yeah. uh, I was called to her work as well. Yeah. And I just know behind the scenes, a lot of like um, uh, people who grew up in and around Bubus, literally, um, um, were so excited to engage with your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's so nice when you. Uh, also, also during art school, I had so, so often I was thinking like, what can I make so people can find me? People like me can find me. Yes. Like, do mm. I need a sign or what can we do <laughs> to find each other? So that's the really same way I write. Mm. That's the same <laughs> way. Is yeah. this? I think that a lot of it is all like trying to put up a sign and be like, can someone <laughs> come find me? Like, if you're a black alien imagination, Send like, help. On, like yeah. a being, this is for you. This yeah. is for you. And yeah. then, and then when you converge. It's like intimate. It's like, oh, we already, like it's so weird to me. I'm like, oh, we're just meeting. Yeah. yeah. You know, but we've been calling out to each other. Uh, yeah. Like, a yeah. lot of us. Mm. And I was wondering, Gavin, you know, <laughs> like talking about ancestors, yeah. how, does, how do you feel about that? How does that yeah. relate to your work? Growing up, um, uh, I was always already connected with uh, my ancestors and I would love for you to come live in the Netherlands, because then I can, because then I can invite you to a Surinamese birthday party. Uh, our, I love that. It's amazing. Um, three weeks ago, I was invited again for my friend's 30th birthday party, and mm -hmm. he is Surinamese, but he also has um, um, a little bit something. In Hames, uh, heritage. Um, indigenous. Indigenous. Yes, indigenous heritage. Uh -huh. Indigenous um, to where? Um, well, in Suriname, Here? you had oh, no, like in Suriname, right. you had like you know the original people. Original people, and then the <laughs> exactly. So you have this interesting mixture of different cultures and traditions and religions as well. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know for the people who have been to a Surinamese mm. birthday party, mm. but it's in a room, a big room yeah. with lots of food, lots of music, different outfits. And then there will also be a certain part of the evening where there's uh, room and time for spirituality. Get it. Um, and then, you know, the, the priestess comes in, the the Wien The birthday? Pre. Yes, the Winti Pre starts. <laughs> Um, there's holy smoke. Um, oh, yes. the, 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 the live musicians, they lead the, the, the birthday person oh, yes. into this different spectrum. And then the family members, mostly um, the, the sister or the mom, or they also get on that level. And that's how I grew up. Mm. Every oh, birthday party, up. right? So, and when you're young, you're like, okay, like I'm ready for my birthday party. Something's, <laughs> something's happening. Give me the holy smoke. Yeah. And when you're when you're when you're growing, then you start to understand. Mm. You're you're clicking like, okay, that's what happened to my sister that evening. And then you start doing oh. your research, right? Um, How was your own birthday party? What did you experience there? Um, well, the last time that we've done it, it mm. was my fifth birthday party. It was um, a while ago. Yeah, and that was amazing. It was very, very, very young, but I can vividly remember my sister's birthday party. Uh -huh. as she also has that same heritage. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just in awe. Um, but then there comes a certain moment in your life where you kind of lose the connection. Mm. Um, and my last name is Fabri. I hardly use it because it's still connected to the colonial history. Mm -hmm. So it's bittersweet for me. And then a few years ago, I started doing research because I wanted to know uh, more about my ancestors because yes. my my family tree started at 1917. That's nothing, mm. right? So then I did a research, and um, now it starts at 1806, wow. uh, which gave me a lot of power. And I also learned that um, the last um, um, uprising um, during slavery on mm. a plantation was the plantation where my ancestors were. So I was like, wow. okay, the activism mm. didn't like, start okay, here. Okay, we were getting it in. We exactly. were getting it Exactly. It didn't start with my uncles yes. in the 70s, but it already started back it then. Yeah. And that and gave it, me so much blood. power yeah, yeah, to start my own healing, yeah. uh, to overcome my own trauma. Yeah. Um, I start my every day with, with um, um, uh, meditation. Mm -hmm. That's my ritual. I'm a super thankful person, and I'm still learning learning and I'm still, you know, getting to know myself and getting mm -hmm. to know my ancestors. But yeah, just knowing who they are, who they were, gave me so much power. They already um, feel like they're behind you. Exactly. And then behind the you. last thing that I want to share is uh, <laughs> the line from my, from, from my grandma. Um, they um, were working on a, a wood plantation. Mm. Um, they had to take wood from the jungle 
because the white folks could not go into the jungle because they would die, <laughs> right? So, so they treated that family line from my grandma uh, better because, you know, or else they wouldn't go. Mm. Um, so they would actually give them a small fee, and with that fee, they could actually save money. Oh, wow. And then I discovered that they already bought themselves free already in 1843, mm. so okay. 30 years prior to... You know, Ooh. so that gave me so much strength because yes. it's always the same narrative of that they were victims mm. and that they did not that do someone anything. Someone else had to liberate them. Exactly, but they took ownership. Mm -hmm. They liberated themselves. Their whole line, their whole future. Um, and they, they were poor afterwards, but it was worth it, right? Poor and free what would is you much do? better than exactly. any other condition. How far would you go yeah. to claim your own freedom? That's so powerful. Mm. And yeah. when I found that information, I just started crying. I didn't uh, expect to cry because mm. toxic masculinity, but uh, <laughs> it, gave me, it gave me so much power and um, there's more research to do. I mean, yeah, yeah. it doesn't start at 1806, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, do the research if you can. Uh, yeah. uh, I love that. I really love hearing that. And you know, I think there's also something around these stories that get hidden in the mm. folds. Yeah. And peop I think for a long time, there's been a sense of like, there's just no way to know. Mm. It's like, no, actually, We've been secretly documenting ourselves or finding ways, you know, there's ways you can find this stuff. Yeah. We just found out where there's this writer named Imani Perry, um, who's an incredible scholar activist in the US and who I've looked up to for years and we'd met and everything. We both did ancestry.com right. and we found out there were cousins, wow. third cousins, and we're both Virgos. We both had <laughs> seven course. books out at the same time when we found out that we were cousins. And we both have a thyroid condition. And we both, there was just like all these things that we were like, OK, so what was going on with that common ancestor that led to this yeah. thing, right? I was like, to me, it feels like something was in that person or those people in that moment of splitting when her folks went to Alabama and, and some of ours and stayed in the Carolinas. Mm. And, and I now, you know, I'm like, if there's not enough research, there's also like, I'm. I'm thinking of the work of uh, Saidi Hardman. This, like, how can I remember yep. mm. the stories through me if I can't find it written down somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and trying to write from that place. Like, I don't know if you know Lucille Clifton's work. No. no. So Lucille Clifton was a black feminist poet uh, writing a lot around the like 1980s, mm. and she did these poems that she called partnerships with her enslaved ancestors because she would start waking up at like four or five o'clock in the morning with these poems and these stories in her head that she's like, I don't know where this comes from. I didn't experience this, but it was the poetry of enslaved women. Mm -hmm. And they're incredible poems, but she's like, it wasn't until she had let them, she was like, oh, I have to surrender and let them come through because mm -hmm. this is my research. This is how I'm remembering. Yeah. yeah part of the story that I'm, it's the mine to tell. Yeah. Exactly, it's mine to tell. Within They're us. in, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I love that idea that, like I really try to create from a place of like, I'm not trying to make something new. Uh -uh. We've right? been here before. Everything is here, mm. but I'm trying to reconstitute the material so that it's compelling for me to want to stay alive. Yeah. Right, because the mm. thing I'm always dancing with mm. is, you know, humans suck. <laughs> right? and I'm just like, why are we so? toxic why are we so harmful why are we so, like when we maybe really it's not the, the good vessels. thing for the earth yeah, yeah i'm like yeah. if we're not good for the earth i would choose the earth mm. and so then trying to come back from that place and be like okay but what would make humans compelling mm. pleasure being birds yeah. aliens you know so collectiveness yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then remembering the cycle turns me on the idea that i'm like oh Someone in my legacy knew how to make this ritual with songs, yes. mm. and they're showing me how. Yeah. They're doing it yeah. again. Yeah. They're, they're with me, or mm. they're, they knew how to create these, these looks. They knew how to build these sculptures. They knew how to, even to critique, right? Mm. They knew, like, I always love thinking about that, too, that our, our enslaved ancestors, our ancestors who were disempowered, they had very sharp critiques of what was happening. They knew exactly what was going on, yeah. and they knew how to put on a face that was like, Whatever you want to think about me, I'm I'm dumb or I'm getting through the work or whatever. But you know that still happens with the workers, and then they turn like this motherfucker has no money. Blah 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 da 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 da. 
<laughs> you know? And I'm just like, yeah, we always have a sharp critique. Class doesn't inform having a sharp critique. Mm -hmm. yeah. Class informs whether your critique is heard, mm -hmm. you know? Definitely. And Definitely. I just love that idea that I'm like, our ancestors were always having a lot of <laughs> opinions, yeah. and now we're just be, we're able let to say them louder and louder. Yeah. True that. It's already within us. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, having said that, um, I think I would like to invite you, Munga yes. to share some of your thoughts. Yeah. Take it to the podium. Do you want to read that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Isabel, sorry. I'm going to break the rules a little bit. Is it still breaking the rules if I tell you beforehand? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm very, very much surprised. <laughs> The language of our people is a language of four thongs. You might have heard of one of them, Ubuntu. Mm. It's actually pronounced as Ubuntu. If you break that down, it says that the Munhu stands for the beings. The chinu stands for the things. The hanu is the space, and the kunu is the possibility. All creations, all essences in all forms and all that is, <laughs> falls under these tongues which speak to the spirit world. And you can recognize the spirit world of a tongue by the sound that fills your mouth with warm air and your ears with melodies when you speak of it. It's the, the stem, the stem, it's the stem on the bud that grows off your tongue as your lips unfold. Ubunu stands for all which was created. It includes the living as well as the dead, the ancestors and the imuka, the messengers, the mediators and the fixers, the sorcerers and the sluts. Hmm. All help the mortals organize their cute but fleeting dimension. And the highest messenger, Imana, is both air and flesh and is everywhere in Hanu. The child will not learn about all four tongues in its first few years of life, especially not about the kunu, the possibility. The mortals say that existing in a way that does not exist is difficult for a child to comprehend. So this kunu, this possibility that stands for hope, this kunu, this possibility that stands for hope, is something you cannot view or hold, they tell the child. But the child no knows it can express and experience it, almost like a spell. This kunu, this hope, comes from all things ensouled by enchantment. Trees, instruments, animals, spaces, pleasure. 
all that is juice and all that is water. Mm. <laughs> so when I think of black joy in conversation with emergence, I think of this Chinyarwanda word for emerging as more than one. Multiplicity, Ubginshi. Ubginshi is an indication of quantity, but it is more than that. It means both quantity and destination, like a deep well that you can sit in. I was talking to a friend when we were displaced and um, she said, how are you? I said, I am well. And she said, I'm well too. And I said, I want us to be in the well too. Mm, yes. On the edge of Lake Chivu, children like me are born in a state of Ubginshi. We are curious, rebellious, and because we are born at the water's edge, we see everything in life as fluid. Mm. The mythology around this lake considers that a witch kidnapped into the region by the royal court gave birth to that lake by orgasm. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I believe. Allegedly. <laughs> so now, thousands of years of volcanic orgasmic activity <laughs> have caused an accumulation of <laughs> carbon dioxide. <laughs> <laughs> in the depths of Kivu, mm. making our birth water explosive. And so from the deep, fresh water of that lake, from the deep, fresh water of that lake, clouds of gas can suffocate livestock and people. <laughs> I came to understand how expensive the world is in that water. My understanding was its own birth. My understanding was its own birth in three acts. First, screaming like amniotic fluid, then screeching like holy water, and later crying like the swell we crossed into Europe to start a new life in the abroad. First, screaming like amniotic fluid, then screeching like holy water, and later crying like the swell we crossed into the abroad. And in this new land, I found myself hiding, hiding under tables, hiding, standing next to the light, hiding under tables, standing next to the light. Under these tables, I drew portraits of grown-ups who visited our living room to discuss grown-up things with each other, sticky things that I overheard but could not begin to understand. Under those tables, I tried instead to capture the faces of grown-ups as side portraits. Looking at an auntie or uncle in profile meant not seeing them for all that they really were, which made their horror stories less real too, except for their eyes, because the eyes always speak, even from the side. When I 
would crawl out from under the table and they would remember I was in the room, I would see their full expressions again, startled at my uh, drawings. I found Ubginshi in clothes. I wore my brothers and they wore mine. They, there were no boy clothes or girl clothes. None of it made me feel like I was doing something wrong until mounds began to grow on my 11-year-old chest. I was given a pair of Hello Kitty pajamas from my favorite uncle, excitedly walked into the garden in my new pajamas and felt my nipples poking through the top of the pajamas. I noticed the startled faces of my parents and that of my uncle who looked to the ground with his face folded. Finally, and ultimately, I found Ubginshi in words, words to embrace myself with, to say all that has been left unsaid or left behind at the waters. I ride of homes to wrap my tongue around, words to multiply myself with. Ubginshi is not only a quantity but a destination, a deep well that you can sit in. As a child, I believed in Ubginshi, this magic in an unbridled way. I saw magic in all things I had no explanation for. Magic was why I could fly in my dreams, why a wound hurt less when my favorite auntie kissed it, why a chicken kept running when its head was cut for slaughter, why birds found their way home at the beginning of spring, why my parents escaped death through the eye of a needle in wartime. But I was called to womanhood early. Words like luck for family and sin for my body came and took the place of magic. Magical thinking became a false belief, imagining freedom a thing of superstition. Over the years, I've learned that the way people envision the future is often influenced by the limitations people know from their past. Mm. Trauma is not an identity. Yet, it is sometimes difficult to look beyond the comfort of habitual pain. We sometimes carry the weight of trauma for so long that we don't know who we are outside of suffering. Right. Our dignified em emergent lives start at the borders of trauma. And as resistance workers, we have to be able to envision the day after the revolution before we know what the revolution is actually working towards. The revolution in itself cannot be the goal. Future thinking is the audacity to dream. And what makes this mindset a challenge is what it demands of the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves to be post-revolutionary and self-evidently free, which then poses the next question, 
Who do we want to be when we finally get to freedom? Thank you. Thank you. Mugayanda, you can break my rules anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking great. This was, this was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. It's really wonderful. Thank you. Almost don't, I, it's not often that I, as a moderator, like, I'm actually speechless. <laughs> um, I don't also, um, yeah, this, this has really touched me, thank mm. you, thank you. Mm. Um, mm. Can we all take a breath with it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good idea. Mm. <sighs> Maybe if you all want to also hold hands with someone nearby and we just received such a blessing. That <laughs> sometimes one person can speak and invite everyone's lineage into the room and everyone's memories and everyone's wisdom. I feel like you just offered us this. So let's take a deep breath in to receive it and exhale. Our gratitude, a deep breath in for the space, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't know what a follow-up question is after this. Um, sorry, I forgot how to moderate. Um, <laughs> but this is fine, this happens. Um, I think this is wonderful. Um, is there anybody who would like to reply to what you just heard, Adrian? I mean, you know, I have to tell you something, which is I have a, one of my nibblings, the children of my sister, is 13, and she's a novelist and a poet and a ferocious, rebellious fighter. Mm -hmm. And somehow you have her face, her spirit, her energy. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm looking at you and it's mm -hmm. her I see. And it makes me, f like listening to everything you were saying about what the child receives and what the child knows and what the child receives and the fluidity. Um, this is actually the place most of my hope does come from now mm -hmm. is the possibility in these children, even as I'm rageful and disappointed with where we are, they're like, bitch, I'm queer. <laughs> I'm free. I'm fluid. I'm uncontainable. I'm bringing my rage into your face. Mm -hmm. I'm, I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I felt that in your body, the combination of knowing what you were talking about while your whole body is shaking with the power of what is coming through you mm -hmm. and the dignity that you gave yourself to just be like, wait, I need another moment to mm -hmm. breathe and feel it. Mm -hmm. It's just so powerful. Mm -hmm. It was so powerful and it's so healing for me to witness. Mm -hmm. Thank you, really, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Munganyanda, you also talk about, like in, in the piece you just wrote, you talk about these limitations, mm -hmm. trauma that f um, give us these limitations and mm -hmm. how, how can we move beyond these? Mm -hmm. That's a question you pose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was wondering also, looking at the other speakers, is this something you recognize the limitations of mm -hmm. trauma, of labels, of whatever? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, trauma can. Sorry, maybe uh, I should just <laughs> yeah, uh, affect your life. Uh, right? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so it's uh, Not the yikes. so important for for it's a personal experience, of course. Mm. The intensity is different for each and every one of yeah. us. And then uh, if you have the, this this uh, uh, four part language, mm -hmm. um, also mm. you know ancestral healing. Mm -hmm. that can help you through it mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and my wish is for for people not to go through that by themselves mm -hmm. but really you know sharing their truth yeah uh, with others mm -hmm. and, and finding the empowerment mm -hmm. there uh, right? it, it yeah. takes a child to to uh, it, it takes a village to raise a child um, and also you know to overcome trauma mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to do it by yourself mm -hmm. there are people uh, next so to you that's yeah Yeah. Yeah. I think also, I had that yesterday a few times, and I had it now again a few times, that all of a sudden I was not really l hearing what was said, and you have these few memories coming up, yeah. and I did not really like it, also <laughs> yesterday I did not really like it. Yeah. Uh, mm. And I have sometimes in work or when you do stuff, <coughs> I have that lately more and more that I sometimes get a bit quite fast frustrated or angry yes. with, with <laughs> people where I have to do something. Mm. That you have this feeling like you already have enough of me or that you want to uh, leave me alone, this yeah. kind of feeling. And then yesterday and <coughs> today also again at this moment, this is discomfort, but also feeling like, okay, it's there, I cannot. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah. yeah, it's there, but you can't escape. No, <laughs> no but the funny thing is sometimes you don't even feel like you're escaping something. Mm. Yeah. You're just frustrated. I said to my sister last time, I think maybe... Maybe I do have to have to talk with someone again because yeah. I'm getting so angry so fast and I don't know why, but... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you have these little things like, okay, it's bubbling up. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, every time I'm making my work right now, I keep having this experience where I'm like, I think I know myself. Um, and then a flashback will come up mm. or something will happen. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, first of all, that happened? Yeah. And how did I survive that happening? And how, oh, someone very young, my seven, you know, my seven-year-old self. Uh -huh. I had a one time where a seven-year-old version of me stepped forward and it was like a whole fog behind her. And she was like, I made you this. I made you this and everything's in there. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. It's in there. Yeah. And I was like, but I want to know what's in there. And she goes in and she comes back out with a two-year-old me. Ooh. And I was like, okay, I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't think I can know yet. I don't think I can handle it. But then what I do know is that all of that was my brilliant self. Mm -hmm. And the discomfort is being with all of that, yeah. right? That I'm like, yeah. I don't want to know that my two-year-old self had to be brilliant yeah. in that way. Yeah. I don't want to know that my seven-year-old self had to be brilliant in that way. Yeah. I don't want my ancestors to have to have been brilliant in that way. Mm. It's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But there's the other side of it, which is if, if that hadn't happened, I would not be here. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, some part of the reclamation, again, is like... Yeah. Even that discomfort, yeah, or like the snippy, you know, like I got so angry at my collaborators at one point, yeah, you know, that I broke. I was like, it's just too much. You're asking me to feel everything in front of all these people. I don't fucking know these people. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Why? You know, I was like, I'm not going to. F I'm not on display. I'm not yeah. emotions on display. Yeah. And they're like, you're not emotions yeah. on display. You're yourself in a ritual, mm -hmm. and the ritual demands you to be yourself, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. emotions are going to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want them to come. That's fine, but that will be the limitation of the ritual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wherever you're not willing to go, no one else will go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, God. <laughs> <laughs> so we went there. Mm. Yeah. For those who miss it, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we are um, we still have Gavin Fiano's oh, yes. piece to listen to, and um, <laughs> we have a, there's a lot going on. Um, we will first um, Gavin Fiano is going to close tonight, so we're first going to go um, to um, questions. But before before we do that, I would uh, there was one question at the end that you posed: Who do we want to be when we finally get to freedom? Um, and I thought maybe we could all uh, give a word that encapsulates what we want this future to look like, just as a promise for the future, maybe. Mm. Sorry, I'm, I'm not, I did not, didn't hear it. Munga Yanda, she... There's, there's, a, there's a lot of feelings today. There's a lot of things that happen. I do not blame you. I also just... Okay, we're not going to get into that. But, um, I asked... Because um, Munga Yanda asked the question, who do we want to be when we finally get to freedom? And I thought it would be nice to maybe all share a word that kind of encapsulates how we think that freedom, sh that um, future should look, look like. I'll give you a moment. And whenever somebody's ready. I will say for me, freedom would feel like belonging. Mm. I would know that I, as I am, belong. Mm. Uh, the first word that came to mind was to be a butterfly. Mm. So I'm just going <laughs> to... Sure, that, is, that. that is beautiful. Yeah, just it's cool because right now the plant leaves behind you for me. Like <laughs> Give party. me plant wings. <laughs> I'm like, bitch, I see you. <laughs> yes. This might be super like uh, of like an obvious uh, answer, but the first and only word in my head popping up is consistently black. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. And but I feel that in that being black on purpose, yes. to me it feels like something that even when I get to freedom, I still want, I still will choose to wake up black mm. because of all. I'm not gonna be tricked into thinking that 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 trauma is intrinsically linked to being black. Mm. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just love the dignity of being black. Mm. So, yeah. mm. And the last word for you, Vadil? Um, I think maybe for me, if you have to less manifesting or less, less um, I think also for me, mm. I think you also get really good at that when you, also when you're mixed, you have all these different and you're a woman and you're black, mm. and you get so good in in adapting to all these yeah, little things. And, mm. 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 And it tricks your own mind. Mm. I think put f f free to not have to do not tricking not doing those things. Mm. But just Being that it's go that. I don't know how that <laughs> just be, to exist, but, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Just to yeah. exist. Mm. Without the burden of having to And you don't even, it's not like you think about it all the time, no. but it just happens all the time. And it's, it's reality. Also, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Being less good in that or not having to do that, something like that. Oh, Thank that you makes for that. me nauseous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like that. I'm like, oh my god, I want that so much. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> what we are going to do, audience, is that um, I'm sure there are people with questions, and we can do a few, and then afterwards uh, we will close with Gavin Fiano's performance. Um, I do want to say about that performance. <laughs> as a is, butterfly. As a butterfly. <laughs> it's yes. not a performance. It better be. <laughs> it's a remake. <laughs> okay, how do you. You got a couple minutes it? to make we it into one. It. It's, now it's a butterfly <laughs> performance. Yes. yes. It is. Special, special moments. Um, I do want to say um, it is a really beautiful and personal piece, but it also deals with, uh, with sexual trauma. So I just wanted to give you that as an audience, that if there are people in the room that might not feel 
uh, comfortable with that, which is completely understandable and super valid, then maybe um, I would also give you want to give you the space to uh, to already leave the room. Mm. Um, let's first go to questions whilst you make up your mind. Is there anybody with a question? Mm. Oh, like wow. half the room. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think we should <laughs> seen you guys. try to do three. Is there anybody with a burning question? Putting a high I will go first go right. to you. Yeah. Wow. First, I see all the faces. I know, I'm like, there's so many people here. Hi. <laughs> um, firstly, I just want to say thank you to all of you. It's so nice to hear um, black artists in a room together engaging so vigorously with their own work and each other's work. Um, mm. It's been really like heartwarming to hear this conversation. So thank you to all of you. Um, my question is in two parts. It's one question, but two parts. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear. Um, my first question is, um, I'm curious about the work that you all produce as a question for all of you. I've been returning to this quote from Octavia Butler. Like, it scares me to death sometimes, um, always feeling um, drawn to doing something that scares me. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do. And I think about it a lot. How do you guys sit in the fear of creating work that you don't even know where it's coming from, like what it even is, like how do you lean into that? Um, and Adrian, I was fortunate enough to be an initiate in To Feel A Thing yesterday and I still don't have the language um, for what I experienced and I don't think I will and I think that's a good thing actually um, and I'm happy about that. I'm just curious for you, like, because you talked about how you sort of receive songs and like it speaks to you like, I think it's similar to me and uh, something is speaking to me now and it feels, it started off as like a hum, but now it's like a whisper. Like how do you nurture at the beginnings of it so it, it becomes like a roar that you, you properly hear it? Thank you. Thank you for that. Maybe start with Adrian. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I will say this, you know, there's this beautiful Audre Lorde quote that's like, I'll paraphrase, it's basically like, you're gonna be afraid anyway, so speak. And mm -hmm. I think when it comes to this work, for, for me to feel a thing, um, like I've written so many words down and I try to be very personal and present in everything I make, but this feels like the most personal thing I've ever done in my life, in part because every part of it is really scary to me. Like, saying to a room full of people, come listen to these songs I recorded on my voice memo. I mean, every single person that was a part of this piece is a, the expert at what they do, right? Each singer is one of the best singers on earth, mm. and the band is like the best band, and the director is like an award-winning director. Everyone is like the best, and I'm over here like, <laughs> I was a theater kid, and uh, <laughs> I haven't done this for 25 years. I don't know what my voice is going to sound like, but, you know, will you do this? So I just want to say, like, it has been so terrifying. Every single step of it has been so terrifying, and especially the singing. Like, literally, every time we're going to do it, I'm like, I get cotton mouth. I forget how to breathe. I'm like, I can't sing like these people sing. I don't know what to do. Um, but... The thing you just asked, like how do you make something into a roar, what I find is that if I just tell someone else, like even one other person, that's how this started. I got locked out. I was being a doula for one of my friends, and she had to take, for Danny, one of my dear friends, and she's taking her little baby um, to the doctor's appointment. So they, I took them out. I'm in my pajamas. I take them out, put the baby in the car, mm. close the car, go back to go in the house, and I'm locked out in my pajamas, no phone, nothing. And it's like, shit, now they're going to be two hours at least. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the porch, and I sang the whole time. I'm just sitting on the porch, like, singing, and a whole situation is happening inside my head. I just told someone that that happened one person, and she was like, you know, you should talk to someone about this. Like, I was like, my therapist? She's like, no, like, a creator. <laughs> but I kept telling one person, and what I have found is, uh, oh, you only need like one other person to believe in your potential, and that is like just a little ray of sunlight on it. And then people will remember that. So over the years, people kept asking, like, what happened with the music that you were, don't you make music? And like anyone I tell, like, oh, I don't sing. They're like, you sing all the time. Like, what are you talking about? But my identity for myself is I can't do that and I don't do that. 
So last night, that's when I say it was like one of the best nights of my life, I was on that microphone like I was a singer. And I was singing my heart out, and I literally have no idea what it sounded like, but I know that I was having the fucking time of my fucking life. And so it doesn't matter, right? And the Winty Priestess, that's what she said to me too. She was like, I don't know about singing in front of all these people. And then she's like, anyway, here's my song. And she just like starts singing. You know, and I was just like, right, like even she, even everyone is like, I don't, even all the singers, when I would talk to them, they're like, girl, I'm the same way. I don't know if what's going to come out, but you, you do it anyway. So I think there has to be like, the desire has to be just a little bit bigger than the fear. The fear is going to still be there. But if you find the thing that's like, I desire this so much, and I really have lost so many people in this last period of my life. Like, I'm always with my ghosts, everything. My novellas are all written with characters. They're all ghosts. They're, everyone is someone that has died that I love, and I'm trying to continue their life somehow. Mm. And, but that also inst instigates me, because I'm like, I don't know how much time I actually have left. My body is deteriorating faster than I want to acknowledge. Mm. And I'm, the world is a toxic environment to live in, and I feel everything. So I always have this sense of urgency. Even if I have 100 years, it's not going to be enough time for everything I want to make and create and do. So I better get to work making it and doing it. And the fear, I'm like, I can give my life to the fear and spend my whole life never letting anyone see the things I want to make. Or I can give my life to the things I want to make the desire. And the fear will just come along with me. And it's there. you know. And the fear is also aliveness. Right? Like, I'm not scared to do something if I don't give a fuck about it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, shit, I'll show up and, like, I don't even do anything I don't care about, so I don't know what it is, but like, <laughs> I don't have, you know, like I literally, I quit any job that I'm, I, I'm this person. I'm just like, I'm not gonna waste my life. I'm not, I'm not gonna waste it. And when I do this kind of work, I'm like, this is living. Like this is living. Even if the question I'm asking is like, am I alive? The answer is yes, you know? And I think that that's the only thing to spend our lives on. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> But you asked a question that you wanted to hear the other artist answer also. I'm sorry I went on so long. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess it's sort of following on from what you said about sort of when you're creating newness work that doesn't exist, new worlds, like how do you feel into the fear of that kind of like unknown of that and still birth it um, anyway? And what's that, what's that conversation look like for yourself, with yourself? It's a drive, it's an interesting conversation. Um, it's almost something like optimistic fear or uh, fearful pleasure. Um, it's something, I don't know, for me, I always know that feeling will come because if it's not there and everything just flows like <laughs> just flowing, it's, 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 it almost feels like I'm not being genuine it needs to excite me. It needs to be something that comes from my core. It's an, an, an urgency. If I don't create it that way, if I don't write that story, a part of my core will die. So that's, that's yeah, mm. a, a certain feeling that I always have to find, yeah. I also wanted to say that if you, if you do put it out, for me at least, uh, and the pieces are so, so personal, for me, it also makes my existence safer mm. or more rooted. Mm. So we are sort of smart, but all these things are also in your head <laughs> and it's getting something too much. Mm. And when you put it out, it makes your own existence also, mm. uh, I think, more grounded or mm. rooted. Yeah. So once that's happening, Maybe it's also getting less scary, but it's also it's so super scary. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have another question here. Did you, did you want to say um, something? Hi. It's a bit scary to take the mic because I'm a bit on the verge of crying ever since yesterday, every second of the day today. Oh, That's baby. because of you, Adrian. <laughs> have you let Magic yourself you cry? Today. Hmm? Have you let yourself cry yet? Yes, okay, I definitely good. did. I definitely did. I'm just, I'm, I need to be able to talk right now. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
and I, um, I'm sorry, this is not going to be short and sweet, but I just need to take a moment to thank you with the presence of other people. Because what you gave to me yesterday was so fundamental. Mm. Mm. I was with Clarice a few weeks ago. <laughs> Why you ever? <laughs> <laughs> She's more than a friend uh, th and than a lover. I still don't have any name for it, but we'll maybe get there. Um, and so, <laughs> and Clarice, so, okay, business. The person I can be vulnerable with, and I screamed out to her, "I'm so tired of this endless grief labor." Mm. Yeah. Mm. And yesterday. I was on the dumb square with 4,000 people on stage because I'm a human rights activist for refugee rights. Mm. I was a displaced child. Together, Munga Yende is a sister of mine that I talk about mm. this a lot. Mm. And I'm the founder of refugee millennials. Mm. Millennials like myself who have a refugee background and want to reclaim their power. Mm. And I'm also an Afghan woman mm. who also Often when you're from Afghanistan, you suffer abuse. Mm. And I witness a country that I'm from mm -hmm. with oppressed women that are having the worst conditions towards women in the world. Mm. And I have this background in a country that cusses out refugees on the daily. Mm. So imagine the grief labor we have to go through on mm. the daily mm. with your existence here that goes beyond imposter mm. syndrome. Mm. And so I saw you yesterday with a light on you. And I was wearing a fierce outfit because I was like, let's do gospel with high heels and everything. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to take these heels off. So I took them off and I was like, I'm going to sit across Adrian. And I sat across to you and at a certain point near the end, you asked, what do you need for your healing process? And I heard, my body is mine. Mm. And for the longest time, I, feel, I felt like my body is not mine. Mm. Because it's been claimed by so many pow people in power, mm. especially with the background that I have. And I want to break that chain. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And you said once, I think, um, when a black woman orgasms, the world shakes. I did say that. Something like that. And I thought, when I, <laughs> that's so inspiring. When Afghan women orgasm, yes. I think similar thing happens. Uh, yes. Mm. Come on now. Thank you, Munga Yende, because now I can dream of a day after the revolution of what you just gave to me. But I know you were going to have conversations about this the day after the revolution, to be able to dream of that. Mm. And uh, my question is, <laughs> <laughs> my question is, yes. we need more of what happened yesterday. Uh -huh. Everyone I spoke afterwards, they were like, we need to do this, not every day or every week, because it's intense. Mm. <laughs> but how do you want us to move forward with this? Ooh. You have disciples. <laughs> We're ready. We're 12. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what would the answer be? Where, where can we start? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> what is your name? Sahar. 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 First of all, can I thank you for your testimony? Um, you know, I think what you just did is like what I want <laughs> is for people to go everywhere and tell the truth um, and make people be with the truth um, and let our voices shake. And like I'm all out of time, I try to figure out how do I feel in real time? Like my, my story, my life, I've been so good at not feeling in real time. My, my, my loved ones all know, <laughs> I think that it, you know, there's one of the songs in the show, it takes days to open up the space to feel a thing. Mm. Like that's me, it really takes me sometimes some months and then I'll look back and I'm like, I think I was angry. <laughs> 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 About that, <laughs> you know? 
so uh, just on a human level, like I hope that everyone who encounters my work is the invitation is like, oh, recognize whatever is yourself, that we're connected, we're having these similar experiences, and the, the lie is that they're separate. Or the lie is that they have to be in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, we're, I, ha I have to acknowledge that. Coming to this space, you know, I was like, they're like, you're gonna be in a room full of white Dutch people. And, and the way they, the reverberation of that was as if their humanity and mine can't mm. dance. Mm. Um, but I come from a lineage of dancing across those separations. I come from a great love story. Mm -hmm. So I know there's something else that's true. Your existence. Also. My existence is that, right? It's like, it was all a lie. So that's one thing is like telling the truth in the face of the lie or any space where someone is asking you to lie. And I think if the society falls apart because of that, good. <laughs> I think that's good. I think that this is a time when like a lot of fucked up systems actually need to fall apart mm -hmm. um, and, and we need to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. The second thing is <clears throat> my vision for that piece, for the to feel a thing ritual, is that it actually, we've, we've been playing with it and developing it and we're making sheet music Everything I'm like writing down, like here's what I'm saying, and not like a script, but more like a, a score, like an instruction, so that it's like, okay, here you welcome the people in, and now we sing this song. And then here you tell the people what a ritual is and what is emergence, and then we do the tuning. And now you testify, and then we do this song, and then you, you bring in your science fiction ancestor, and then we do this song, so that it's like, Ultimately, it'll be something that people, my hope is that people are like, we did it in a church basement, we did it in a field, we did it in our school, that we just did, that people, I'm like, I think this is something that I believe everyone needs something like this. It, it doesn't have to be this one, but some variation on a ritual. And, and it's rooted in, when I was doing um, these emergent strategy immersions in 2019, before the pandemic, my, my, my thought was, I'm gonna go around the world and get everyone together for these four day intense deep dives into emergent strategy. And then COVID was like, no, you're not. You're gonna sit still <laughs> and you're going to try not to die while a ton of people around you die. That's what you're gonna do. And then you're gonna slowly come back into the world and no one's gonna stop dying, but we're gonna stop wearing masks. I don't know, right? It's just such a time. So that was like, I have to figure out how to get this thing four day experience because what kept coming up in the four days was the grief ritual was all anybody really wanted. Everyone would come and we'd be like, you can break into small groups, everyone can do whatever you want to do. And they would come back and be like, we have a grief ritual, we have a grief song, we have a grief this, we have a grief that. And I was like, fuck. That's, that's what I say when I say we're at the beginning of this great turning of ourselves. The weight of slavery, the weight of capitalism, the weight of colonization, the weight of these things is, has had us completely flattened as a species. Like We do not understand how flat we are until we begin to expand back into a part of ourselves. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait. Like Last night I was like, I'm much more than I thought I was. Like If I open myself this way, I'm unflattened, like I, I, I felt like m us were filling the whole room and spirit was filling all of us and I felt, I don't know, I was like, I didn't know that was in me, but I think if we did this ritual all around the world and, and I don't have to be there, that's also something that matters to me. I like to be at home, I like to be, <laughs> I mean, I really tell people this, I'm like an introverted person who likes to be at home high on my couch. I love playing Nintendo Switch. I like to be a person. So I'm like, I'm not, I, you know, when people are like, I'm your disciple, you know, I'm like, but I'm not a priestess. I'm not a, I'm not a goddess. I'm, I, I mean, I am a goddess, but like amongst a group of friends who call ourselves a goddess, you know, like nothing in isolation. And that feels very important to me that I'm not creating a condition in which I have to be apart from people mm. and they have to get something from me that they don't have in themselves but I'm trying to constantly be like, how do I feel something come through and be like, here, y'all, here, I found something that everyone can access and it wouldn't work without Clarice and it wouldn't work without my sister and it wouldn't work without Holland Fest inviting me and saying, hey, here's some money. Do you want to develop this 
light tree in the middle of something, you know, like, so I, that iterative part, that's the piece for me. And I'm trying to get there as soon as I can, like to the, everyone has it. And Troy, my collaborator, and thank God for collaborators, Troy's like, but we need to get it to the standard. And I'm like, it's fine. People sing the songs, it's fine, it's great. Like literally we sat in a circle in Oregon like this, practicing it, and I was, t I was orgasmically satisfied. I was like, this is amazing. They just sang these songs that came through my head. <laughs> I'm fucking happy. He was like, but imagine if it was 30 people singing them. Imagine if it was 300 people singing them. Last night we had 500 people singing them. And maybe in St. Louis we'll have a stadium of people singing them. And Noni, she was like, you're thinking too small. What if a whole city would do this ritual together? Like, then what would happen? Mm. I don't know. That, I don't know. But I want to say that, that, to me, the goal is, like, I wish the whole world would pause for a year and do grief rituals mm. and then see what happens. Wow. Yeah. Guys, we are incredibly over time. We have, like, half... I was half. like, does time exist in here? No. I have no idea oh. what's happening. Well, you... <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. I'm like, is um, anyone hungry? <laughs> we will get to the bar. Unfortunately, I we want are all work. invited to, to stay here and also stay at the bar and talk to each other. But I need his work. Of course, that's what we're going okay, to do now. I was like, but I need we're it. Make, <laughs> we're, we're two hours into this conversation and finally we get to uh, listen to a beautiful piece um, by Gavin <laughs> Fiano. Um, who's been double blessed by Beyonce and double is a blessed. butterfly. And uh, a kind reminder for everyone who would like to leave before. Oh, yes. Um, I think this is the time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking care of yourself. Yes. Um, can we do it? Oh, I, was, I, was, I said before that um, Gavin Fiano's uh, work is very personal and it's about uh, sexual trauma as well. I hear you. I just have a question, question. for um, oh, She had a question for her. Okay. Um, I, is it also okay if we do it after? Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Why must my chest produce these little sprouts of hair? Hmm. Why must my armpits generate a sweet and sour pool of sweat? Mm. Why must my muscles pop like this and my voice sound so low? Mm. Oh, hello, penis. All of the sudden, I am grown. Why must I operate during the day when my soul awakes at night? Mm. Why must I be perfect? These rules are all too tight. Why must I be flamboyant and free? Why must the world see me when I love to hide? I know I got to change, but some things must remain the same. This energy, I pray, will pierce through every day and age. Ancestral power and light covered by the blood. This is my time, been so quiet for too long. I embrace my growth. Ancestral power and light covered by the blood. This is my time, been so quiet for too long. I embrace my growth. I embrace my growth. I embrace my growth. I am a small flower, mm. a small boy flower, but mm. I look like a big flower, mm. a big man flower. And since I look like a big flower, people tell me I need to be a big flower. I need to let go of all my boyish ways. Mm. My br big brother, he already a real big man flower. I am nothing like my brother. Mm. He is 11 years older and some more hours. When people try to discriminate me, I pretend to be a strong big flower. Mm. Only only then I imitate my big brother, mm. that big man flower, with his deep voice and convincing charm. He is my example of what a big man flower is supposed to be, but it was my big brother who yelled at me during an argument. He said, Gav, 
You're not a baby flower anymore. You better head out and spread your wings and fly. I said I try, I try, I try so hard to take a leap into the sky, but I have all these millennial issues that I have to deal with, so my rose petals are not ready yet. They are still too meek, still too small, still too green, still too mild, but I do want to be ready. I so, so want to be ready. As I mentioned before, the age gap between my brother and I is 11 years, so he's practically a boomer. Okay, boomer. And like a boomer, he diminished my answer. He didn't understand what I am going through. Okay, boomer. As he was judging my life, I started judging his life. I'm a Libra, so I like to create balance. Fuck you, boomer. I also like to destroy and fuck everything up, if that, yet again, will bring balance. So while he was screaming, I decided that he would no longer have access to me. Goodbye, boomer. Luckily, my mom, the real boomer, will always have access to me. Hey, baby. Hi, mommy. How was your day at school? I liked it. Is that so? Uh-huh. I wonder how much you liked it. I liked it a whole lot. That much? Yeah, a whole lot, lot. Was the teacher nice to you? Yeah. Were the children nice to you? Yeah. They made fun of your beautiful skin? When they do that, I just go away and I play with my friends. Hmm. Mommy will go to school and talk to the teacher about that. Are you excited for your birthday? Yes, I am. How old am I going to be? Aren't you a smart boy? Yes. Aren't you a bright boy? Yes. Aren't you an intelligent boy? Yes. Didn't you learn how to count? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so count for me then. How old are you now? One, two three, four, so how, how old are you going to be in 14 days? One, two, three, four, five. Good job, baby, five. Wow. We're going to throw you a big party. All your cousins, cousins are going to be there. Am I going to get some presents? Yes, you will, but only if you are a good boy. Am I a good boy, mommy? Yes, baby. And because you're a good boy, we got you a cake from your favorite Disney movie. What's your favorite Disney movie? <laughs> the Little Mermaid. Yay. Thank you, Mommy. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Is that the cake you wanted? Yeah, 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 for sure. Thank you. Welcome, baby. At five years old, I was the happiest child because I hoped to get a mermaid cake. And you know what? I got it. I also hoped and wished for something very, very stupid at that age. I wished to become a grown-up. And you know what? I got it. Look at me now, a full-grown human being. Nobody told me how hard this would be. Nobody gave me heads up. I saw my brother and sister enjoying life, but nobody told me that underneath those smiles, they were carrying the burden of responsibility, pressure, a chronic lack of time, sorrow, and pain. Do you experience the same? Why? I want to know if you experience the same. I need to know that I am not the only one who is happy, but also exhausted at the same time. I'm exhausted. What the fuck? The truth? Truth is I'm tired. I'm tired of being able to do so much and in the process of wanting more and more, I also get more and more and more and I am so full and greedy for life. But when is it enough? When will it be enough? I don't cry that often. Look at all this testosterone. I'm the kind of guy that will acknowledge being toxic, move on and sleep just fine. Don't judge me, don't judge me, okay? Honesty is the first step to a healing process and I am so honest with y'all right now. <laughs> But I do cry sometimes and I bet you cry as well sometimes. I don't know why you might cry sometimes, but I cry for all the children who have been sexually abused. I belong to the black community the LGBTQIA plus community, the millennials, the millennials, the hip hop, gospel, and R&B community, the I see spirituality in everything community. And since 1999, I also belong to the sexual abuse community. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. I was touched by a molester, so I changed. And because I changed, I had to take reflective, adaptive baby steps while changing. Did my molester change? Who knows? What I do know, I saw how it changed my world, my mind, my heart, my fantasy, my family, even parts of my soul, even though I feel that my soul has been on this journey before.
All that you change changes you, huh? Okay, okay. I was 11 years old when I was sexually abused. It happened during recess. I ran away with blood in my underwear. I sat down next to my classmates with blood in my underwear. And after a while, I confessed to my teacher there was blood in my underwear. My mom and I visited the doctor, so I lied about the blood in my underwear. The conclusion of my mom was that I was growing. The conclusion of my doctor was that it was not adding up. It took me four years before I could let my sister know what happened. It took me 19 years to call the police and ask how pressing charges would work. It took me 21 years before I could write about my story, my truth. As I took my time, I had the urge to adjust. I could no longer stay quiet or else I would die. I had to create an emergent strategy. The only thing was that the first part of this was all by myself. When I felt like I was healing, not healed, I decided to write a play about my truth. I needed to claim agency over that sexual trauma, always walking around like you were the prey, the victim. I had to reflect, take control over what happened and tell it my way, the best way. And as I started writing and casting actors and directing this play and touring with this play, all of a sudden I had found the collective. The only thing was the collective did not really know how autobiographic uh, this play was. The lead actress called this play Blood Scent. A young woman's spiritual awakening found through guidance of her ancestors. She had to overcome sexual trauma in order to continue to live live. I cried during this process. I cried for 10 minutes with my family at the premiere and a large group of audience members cried in front of me after seeing this play. They confessed to me that they had too been molested. Some of them wanted to bring their family members to the show because they were not able to make their family feel what they felt. Some of them wanted to close the room that had been open again. I never knew that this would be the effect I had to change, I had to adjust, or else I would die from the inside. I had to answer a natural urge to come up with a strategy in order for a key part of my being to continue to exist. The state of errative silence is not a healthy state. With this play, I gave myself and all the other children who did survive, and all the children who died, a specific way to speak, to cry, to sing out into the universe. I did intentionally create this play, but it was not my intention to evoke these deeper emotions. I wanted to change the narrative. I wanted to change the Dutch style of theater plays. I wanted to change the faces you always see in the public space. The next step for me is to create theater plays that really instigate change so that a specific audience can go back home and live a better life. It sounds big, but I know I can do it. Just not alone, but with the collective, a very important part of emergent strategy. Our sorrow carves out the space for our joy. Our sorrow carves out the space for our joy. Our sorrow carves out the space for our joy. Therefore, I let my grown responsibility create the space for my youthful heart. Even when I am tired, I want to get back up. Even when I feel like I am an ugly duckling, I will find others who also feel like they are ugly ducklings, even when we are not. We are beautiful, even when the status quo does not see that. In this fucked up world, there is fucked up beauty, and I choose to be alive. I love life. I want to live. So every evening, I decide over and over and over that the next morning again, I will live. Hey, mommy. Yes, baby. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What's on your mind? Remember my fifth birthday? Yes, of course. We had three different outfits for you. 150 guests came. You were running around and shaking your booty like there was no tomorrow. Of course I remember. <laughs> what about it? Why did you buy me that mermaid cake? Why was I allowed to have that big mermaid cake. Why wouldn't we get you that mermaid cake? That's what you wanted, duh. 
you were that mermaid from the day you were born, from the day you started singing before you could speak, from the day you started performing on the tram, on your bike, in front of your classmates, at church, from the day you told me you were going to Paris all by yourself as a teenager. From those moments on, your soul already spoke out unto all of us that no matter what would come on your path, no matter how grown you would be, you would always embrace joy. You are joy. Don't mind people questioning your energy, your sexuality, your mind, your skin color. You have always embraced joy. And I am sure that no matter matter which body your soul will take as its new instrument, even when you become an animal, a grumpy grandpa, even when you become a rigid stone, a sperm cell, or a stubborn small boy flower. You will always embrace joy. Thank you, Adrian Marie Brown, for inspiring me. <laughs> Thank you for that, Gavin Fiano. That was really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us tonight. Um, if it's all right with the room, I know that there's a question here, but I would like to ask, you, ask it later. Um, I think this is time to <laughs> end the evening. I thank you so, so much for listening. I want to talk my, I want to thank my beautiful guests, Bodil, Monganyande, Gavin Fiano. And of course, Adrian Marie <laughs> Brown, thank you so much for being here, for being in the space with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> you so guys much. are making me like snort cry. <laughs> I, um, I just have to say, I just really didn't expect all of this, like whole experience. Um, it feels like we've been in a cave for a long time, kind of like away from each other. Mm. And I can't believe I didn't know you all, <laughs> you know? Mm. But you all feel like a part of me. Mm. And I, I feel like a part of you. Mm. Like I feel more alive and more myself now because I know all of you and our work is weaving together. Mm. I even feel, I hope I can say this correctly, that I'm always thinking about death. And I just had one of my dear friends who died by suicide. Mm. Um, and, and I have been wrestling with the fact that I can feel his peace, like this deep peace mm. that he didn't have when he was alive as a black queer boy. He didn't have someone who was like, yes to the mermaid cake and yes to the joy. And it makes me feel like the peace of my own death is possible when I come across this kind of art. Because I'm like, the river is flowing. And I've done my part to move one rock out of the way. And you're doing your parts to move the rocks out of the way so we find each other. And like those who tried to genocide us, and still try, they fucking failed. Because look at how we're flowing with each other. So I am so grateful. You give me a good life and a good death, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and I, I just love you all, and I hope we're a family forever now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. <laughs>